One of my favorite warrior slogans from Tony Robbins is this mantra where you can repeat all the time. I like this one a lot. It's in every day, in every way, I am getting stronger and stronger. This is Alma Wayne Myers, and you are listening to Epilepsy Hell to Epilepsy Well. Why not do something about it? And today we're still reading The Places That Scare You, A Guide to Fearlessness in Difficult Times by Pema Chadron. Chapter 5, Warrior Slogans. In all activities, train with slogans. Mind training slogan of Atisha. In the 11th century, Atisha de Pankara brought the complete bodhicitta teachings from India to Tibet. In particular, he emphasized what are called the Lojong teachings, the teachings for training the mind. What is so up to date about these teachings is that they show us how to transform difficult circumstances in the path of enlightenment. What we most dislike about our lives is the meat and potatoes of the mind training practices of Atisha. What seems like the greatest obstacles, our anger, our resentment, our uptightness, we use to fuel the awakened bodhicitta. For some time after the death of Atisha, these teachings were kept secret, passed on only to the close disciples. They did not become widely known again until the 12th century, when the Tibetan Gisha Chekawa organized them into 59 pithy slogans. These slang sayings are now known as the Lojong slogans, or the slogans of Atisha. Becoming familiar with these slogans and bringing them to mind throughout our lives is a valuable bodhicitta practice. Gisha Chekawa had a brother who was contemptuous of the Buddhist teachings and was always giving him a hard time. However, when many lepers who were studying with Chekawa became cured, his brother began to get an interested, very interested in what they were being taught. Hiding outside Chekawa's door, the iris, irascible brother started listening to the teachings on using uncomfortable circumstances as the path. When Chekawa began to notice his brother becoming less irritable, more flexible, and more considerate, he realized that his brother must be listening to the mind training teachings and applying them. It was then that he decided to teach the Lojong slogans far more publicly. He figured that if he could help his brother, they could help anyone. Ordinarily, we are swept away by habitual momentum and don't interrupt our patterns even slightly. When we feel betrayed or disappointed, does it occur to us to practice? Usually not. But right there, in the midst of our confusion, is where the slogans of Atisha are most penetrating. The easy part is to familiarize ourselves with them. More challenging is to remember to apply them. To remember a slogan right in the middle of irritation, for example, always meditate on whatever provokes resentment, might cause us to pause for before acting in our resentment by saying something mean. Once we are familiar with it, a slogan like this will spontaneously pop into our mind and remind us to stay with the emotional energy rather than acting it out. The mind training slogans present us with a challenge. When we are escaping the present moment with a habitual reaction, can we recall a slogan that might bring us back? Rather than spinning off, can we let the emotional intensity of that rock red hot or ice cold moment transform us? The pith of the slogan practice is to take a warrior's attitude towards discomfort. It encourages us to ask, how can I practice right now, right on this painful spot, 
transform this into the path of awakening. On an average day of our lives, we have plenty of opportunities to ask this question. The slogan, train in the three difficulties, gives us instruction on how to practice, how to interrupt our habitual reactions. The three difficulties are, one, acknowledging our neurosis as neurosis, two, doing something different, and three, aspiring to continue practicing this way. Acknowledging that we are all churned up is the first and most difficult step in any practice. Without compassionate recognition, recognition that we're stuck, it's impossible to liberate ourselves from confusion. Doing something different is anything that interrupts our ancient habit of tenaciously indulging in our emotions. We do anything to cut the strong tendency to spin out. We can let the storyline go and connect with the underlying energy or do any of the bodhicitta practices introduced in this book. Anything that's non-habitual will do. Even sing and dance or run around the block. We do anything that doesn't reinforce our crippling habits. The third difficult practice is to then remember that this is not something we do just once or twice. Interrupting our destructive habits and awakening our heart is the work of a lifetime. In essence, the practice is always the same. Instead of falling prey to a chain reaction of revenge or self-hatred, we gradually learn to catch the emotional reaction and drop the storylines. Then we feel the bodily sensation completely. One way of doing this is to breathe into our heart. By acknowledging the emotion dropping, whatever story we are telling ourselves about it, and the feeling, the energy of the moment, we cultivate compassion for ourselves. Then we could take this a step further. We could recognize that there are millions who are feeling the way we are and breathe in the emotion for all of us that wish that we could all be free of confusion and limiting habitual reactions. When we can recognize our own confusion with compassion, we can extend that compassion to others who are equally confused. This step of widening the circle of compassion is where the magic of bodhicitta training lies. The irony is that what we most want to avoid in our lives is crucial to awakening bodhicitta. These juicy emotional spots are where a warrior gains wisdom and compassion. Of course, we'll want to get out of those spots far more often than we'll want to stay. That's why self-compassion and courage are vital. Staying with pain without loving kindness is just warfare. When the bottom is falling out, we might suddenly recall the slogan, if you can practice even when distracted, you are well trained. If we can practice when we're jealous, resentful, scornful, when we hate ourselves, then we are well trained. Again, practice means not to continue to strengthen the habitual patterns that keep us trapped. Doing anything we can to shake up and ventilate our self-justification and blame. We do our best to stay with a strong energy without acting out or repressing. As we do so, our habits become more porous. Our patterns are well-established, seductive, and comforting. Just wishing for them to be ventilated isn't enough. Those of us who struggle with this know, awareness is the key. Do we see the stories that we're telling ourselves and question their validity? When we are distracted by a strong emotion, do we remember that it is our path? Can we feel the emotion and breathe it in our hearts for ourselves and everyone else? If we can remember to experiment like this, even occasionally, we're training as a warrior. And when we can't practice, when distracted by but knowing that we can't 
we are still trading well. Never underestimate the power of compassionately recognizing what's going on. When we're feeling confused about our words and actions and about what does and doesn't not cause harm, out of nowhere, the slogan of the two witnesses hold the principal one might arise. Of the two witnesses, self and other, we're the only one who knows the full truth about ourselves. <clears throat> Sometimes the way we see our ignorance is by getting feedback from the outside world. Others can be extremely helpful in showing us our blind spots, particularly if they cause us to wince. We'd be wise to pay attention to their insights and criticism. But ultimately, we are the ones who know what's happening in our hearts and minds. We're the only ones who hear our internal conversations, who know when we withdraw or feel inspired. When we begin to train, we see that we've been pretty ignorant about what we're doing. First, we see that we're rarely able to relax in the present moment. Second, we see that we fabricated all kinds of strategies to avoid staying present, particularly when we're afraid that whatever's happening will hurt. We also see our strong belief that if only we could do everything right, we'd be able to find a safe, comfortable, and secure place to spend the rest of our lives. Growing up in the 50s, for a while, I believed that what I saw on television sitcoms was the typical family. They all got along, nobody got drunk or flew into a rage. There was never any real ugliness. Many of us watching thought, of course, that only our family was exception to the norm. The truth went unspoken in favor of this American dream. As we practice, we begin to know the difference between our fantasy and reality. The more steadfast we are with our experience, the more aware we become of when we start to tighten and retreat. When we are denigrating ourselves, do we know it? Do we understand where the desire to lash out at another is coming from? Do we aspire not to keep going down the same old self-destructive road? Do we realize that the suffering we feel is shared by all beings? Do we have any longings for all of us to stop sowing the seeds of misery? Only the principal one knows the answers to these questions. We can't expect always to catch ourselves spinning off a of habitual reaction, but as we begin to catch ourselves more frequently and work with interrupting our habitual patterns, we know that the bodhicitta trading is seeping in. Our desire to help not just ourselves, but all sentient beings will slowly grow. So in all activities, not just sometimes when things are going well or particularly bad, train with the bodhicitta slogans of Atisha. But remember, don't try to be the fastest. Abandon any hope of fruition and don't expect applause. I'd like to thank you for listening and leave you with some food for thought. So we've been discussing throughout this last chapter, warrior slogans and pattern interrupts. So oftentimes we have found that we are on autopilot or we've been programmed or conditioned, you know, from the time that we were born by the people we were raised by, the people that we grew up with. You know, everybody uh, has their opinion on what they think your life should mean to them. And that's why it's important for you to decide and determine what your life means to you. Because I've always said only you can decide whether you are happy or miserable. Only you can determine this on the inside. Nobody can tell you how you're supposed to be, feel, or act we can only make recommendations about making better choices, about stopping the self-destructive behavior 
and realizing that you don't want to be in a constant battle with yourself, that that is a never ending war that leads to more unhappiness, more destructive behavior, more downward spiral, and the loss of whatever sanity is you might still be hanging on to. Because, man, it gets crazy trying to deal with so much stuff, so many people, places, things that aren't in alignment with what it is that you want or need for yourself. And oftentimes, we have to be able to separate what is important, what we need, over what we want because we often we want to escape pain we want an easy button we want a solution that doesn't require any work and that is not the warrior's path warriors train warriors train up next army you know we went to boot camp basic training to get the basics of how to hold a rifle how to shoot it how to clean it how to set up a tent, how to pull it down, how to work radios, how to work as a team, how to do what you're told, how to follow orders, how to walk together, how to be harmonious so that we can you know, act as a group and a team and actually accomplish the mission, the goals, like win wars, win battles, win fights, and come home the victor and that much stronger for the efforts that you put in. So make sure you're taking care of yourself this week. Make sure you're doing the best that you can to be the best version of yourself. Give yourself the love and compassion and the break that no one else is giving you because you deserve to love yourself. Don't let anybody else ruin or dim that light inside of you. Make sure you are, you know, protecting it from the people that will destroy it and make sure that you are allowing the people to help you cultivate it and grow it to help you cultivate and grow it you you know know, we're all in the process of learning and discovering and i've been meditating for 21 years you know i've been fighting for my whole life i've been a warrior since i was a little kid and my dad started hitting me and i'd go flying across the room you know i mean i've been Hopefully many of you haven't had to go through the experiences of, you know, being forced into trying to recreate your own reality when everybody else around you is trying to make you worse for the wear or take their crap out on you. So you are important. You matter. People suck and it doesn't, you don't have to make it about you. People are going through crap. You know, they don't know how to deal with their own problems. They have their own pattern interrupts that they need to discover and start doing something other than, you know, the routines that we're all, again, we're conditioned uh, either by our environments or ourselves. We decided this is the best way to survive or protect ourselves or understand what's going on. So I challenge you to take a moment, take a deep breath, take a step back to try to become more aware of what you're reactions are and to stop and pause and take a deep breath and understand that through these challenges this is where we grow so grow like the little lotus flower up out of the mud into this beautiful flower make sure you take care of yourself like you matter because you do